All right, Jessica. Jessica, where are you from originally? Where'd you grow up? Um, I grew up in the Fontana and Ontario area. And tell me about your family growing up as a kid. Um, I would say it was very, I have a very chaotic family. So, um. What was going on? Oh man, a lot. I wouldn't know where to, where to begin, but. Um, the problem was your mom or your dad or both? Um, I don't know. Uh, my real dad, personally, I've talked to him on the phone a couple of times, but um, I, didn't, I don't have a relationship with him. Um, I was raised by my mom. And she, uh, I feel like the only way I can describe her is very, she's got, she had a lot of mental problems. So, you was know, a lot of that. Yeah, multiple personality disorder. Oh, really? Yeah. So she's just... It's always been... Which I think now is called DID? Yeah. Something something like that, yeah. So So she would change her oh, yeah. behavior? Oh, yeah. It was very one day from the next kind of situation. So she just... Give me an example of how she would be... Um, I think the biggest... Uh, the thing that stands out in my head would be her drinking majority. Um, she used to call her personality when she would drink. She would call it rage. And I think I got to know that person a little bit more. You know, um, I was very loyal to my mom. I was very, I always, no matter what she did, you know. Um, you still loved her? Oh, yeah, definitely, definitely. To this day, she was um, very suicidal. And when I say suicidal, people think, like, you know, it's so much attempts. But I never got, I never understood until I got older exactly what, you know, the things she would you know, she would do to herself. I personally know now that I'm older, it was a lot of times it was for attempt, you know, attention. A lot of um, attempts were, man, they were, she almost did it, you know. And when I was younger, I think, um, I think it was worse for me when I was younger because I was so innocent at that time. Like she would like shred her wrists up, you know, in these open wounds. And, you know, me being at that age, I was always like, oh gosh, like here, let me put some band-aids on it, you know? So she would knock out drunk and she's sitting there bleeding everywhere. And I would have to, you know, try and patch her up is in my mind, the best that I could, you know, especially being at that age. So, you know, there was attempts when, um, since I was young and I can remember to, you know, now, you know, and in between that there was, you know, taking care of us. You know, I I can't remember a time where, you know, she actually was a top of the line mom. You know, so it's it's and this a I lot. assume is your entire childhood? Yeah. Yeah, there was maybe like I wanna say three years like broken up that she would be like good. You know, she would like she used to get up, she would like run in the morning, she would like, you know, she would really should really motivate me, you know? And then there was times where I just was like, I don't know how I'm like, why am I even, why'd you even have me? Why'd you even have us? You know, so it was real, it was real up and down, you know, with me, especially in the beginning. Um, you know, one point I was, I was molested and she was in this relationship for like 18, 19 years, you know? So I was molested the first four years and- By her partner? Yeah. Yeah, and, you know, my mom has been through the whole drug thing, you know, meth and, you know, holy God knows what, but she actually, um, in the beginning, he used to tell me that he would kill her, and my, that was my mom, that was my, that's my everything, you know, watching her get, you know, beat awful, and then, you know, I would do anything to protect her. I always told myself when I was older, I was always like, you know, I'll, I can't wait till I get older so I can, you know, <laughs> so I can do some damage for you. But after a while and some certain situations that took place, I started realizing that she that she knew, you know, she knew what was happening. There was a point in time where she had, you know, told me and I can remember so clearly that day she just was like, you know, you need to stop encouraging it. You're encouraging it. You know, and I always lived with like this I call it like my it's like a pit in your stomach. It's like an uncomfortable pit. It's like nausea, anxiety, everything mixed together in the center of your stomach. And it's like, you think about that, like, gosh, like, is today going to be this? Is she going to flip out? Is she going to hurt herself? Is she going to hurt someone else? You know, like, and every time she would leave, it was always like, oh man, like, I knew it was going to happen. You know, and Are I got to a child? point. 
Uh, no, actually, I have two other siblings. I have an older sister and I have a little brother. How did they cope with this? Um, How are well, they doing now, basically, is my question. My, uh, my older sister was actually raised by my, um, by my grandparents. You know, my mom kind of just, you know, I don't want to say that they, um, I don't even want to give her that credit that they took her away. You know, like she, she was okay with it. You know, she didn't have like the best relationship with my older sister. You know, I feel like she always gave my older sister the cold shoulder. I don't think my mom wanted girls. I think she she wanted boys. You know, my sister was first born. Um, she would she had like a blue baby shower, and I seen pictures of my sister in like boy clothes. You know, she wanted she wanted a boy. You know, that's how she always she's always been. Here come two girls later. You know, and um, my little brother is is the sweetest kid ever. You know, and I think he was more on the spoiled side because he was he was finally the boy, you know, that she wanted, that everybody wanted, you know, so, um, and that doesn't take away anything that, you know, she has, she's done to him too, you know, like, like I said, it wasn't just her, she didn't realize it was everything she did, everything she said, the way she acted, it impacted everybody, you know, and a lot of what she did till this day um, has affected me, impacted me, you know, recent events that took place, I specifically say August 27th, this is this is where I decided to completely just turn my life around and be sober because I feel like that was the worst she probably has ever put me, my brother, and my sister through. What did she do? Um, so my mom is on the streets right now. You know, and after, I think, uh, I'm going to say three years ago, I had to, I had to turn my back with helping her. You know, I had to, you know let it go. You know, I, I have to watch from, I have to watch out for my kids, you know, and in my head, I'm like, you know, I have my own problems, you know, I got my own, like, you know, my own things, like my sobriety, you know, has taken a lot of time away from my oldest, my daughter, you know, and um, I always told myself when I was younger, I was like, you know, I want to be like her, you know, but you catch yourself sometimes, you don't want to be like somebody, but you, I don't think some people can realize, you know, you don't have to necessarily do exactly what they do to be like that person. You can find yourself self-destructing in different kinds of ways. Me particularly is my drinking. I feel like the only time I can be directly like my mother and just like my mother is when I'm drinking. And that's why I, and it took a long time for me to finally realize that. And um, so let me go back. Um, She's on the streets right now. Uh, I had given up on her because she just, you know, she got involved with this man that just was, um, I mean, not only was he a dangerous man, you know, he had, you know, threatened, you know, my kids at one point, you know, so I told her and she just kept going back to that man. You know, my, that's how my mom is. That's what I think her struggle is. She can't be alone and she always picks the worst kind of men, the men that beat her, the men that use her, you know, like, and she's always been that way. And um, she had said that, she called me one day, she asked me for money, and I was just like, you know what, I'm not, I'm not going to do it. And my mom's the kind, like, if you don't, you don't give her what she wants, she's like, all right, I'm, you know, she'll give me a goodbye message, you know, I'll see you, you know, um, I love you, take care of your brother. Like, it's, oh, it's consistent, you know, but there's not a day where I don't get anxiety thinking, like, gosh, is this going to be the day? Like, it's, so I live with that every single day, you know, and um, so August 27th, I was at my house, I was having some wine, you know, and, and, you know, believe me, we get calls all the time, you know, she'll, she'll post on her own Facebook saying like, oh, you know, rest in peace, you know, and it's herself, she's putting herself on there, you know, and it's like, gosh, like sometimes, but you got to start looking into it, like, you know, I get like this, you know, what if I'm just sitting here, like, it's not real, you know, and, um, so August 27th, we, um, I was, like I said, I was having some wine and, um, I get a phone call from my brother, my little brother. And he's like, you know, I'm panicking. And I was like, well, what's the matter? And he was like, you know, there, um, I seen the post on, on Facebook. They saying that, you know, mom died three days ago and I didn't think anything of it, you know, forgive me for saying that, but I hear it all the time. It's, it's consistent, you know, and it's, it's the lies and the stories are just like astronomical. So I just don't, I don't even you know, not necessarily don't believe it. I just don't feed into it so quickly. I'm not so quick to just, you know, toss everything in the air and go and look for her. So I, um, I told my brother, I was like, look, you need to calm down. You know, my brother takes it very differently. You know, he's at the point in his life where I was, you know, 15 years ago where she can still, she can still hurt him with the smallest little text message, you know, and that's my, my brother is like my, my brother and my sister are like to me, 
they're like, I'm like the protector, you know, I love them and I make sure I protect my brother, you know, so it makes me really angry with her. And so I told him, you know, just calm down. Everything's going to be all right. And I was like, she's probably, he's like, no, I'm hearing it from like, you know, other people that are on the streets with her are saying that they found, you know, her body by the train tracks. And so I started getting a little bit nervous and me in my alcohol ways, I started to, I started just pounding more. I was just like, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to think about it. This is not the kind of day that I'm going to have, you know, I, um, and I called my uncle to be like, okay, you know, this is what I'm hearing. And he was like, you know what? A medical examiner would call us, uh, you know, somebody will get a hold of us. The police will come to the door. So I was trying to calm my brother down, you know, as I'm trying to calm myself down, like, no, just, just relax. So this is, I'm going to say like four hours went by, you know, um, and still it was the same thing, you know, we're hearing this, we're hearing that. And, you know, I had my aunt, uh, my uncle calling, you know, around just to see if maybe did they find a body is something, you know, and she ended up talking to, or he, my brother, sorry, my brother ended up talking to um, that homeless person that, you know, was giving him the information. He was like, no, I heard that um, the man that she was being with, that dangerous man, you know, he killed her. And so my brother started getting like, cause to me it made sense, you know, um, you know, my mom had testified in court against him and, um, you know, she ended up taking everything back. You know, that's, that's my mother. She took everything back and she, um, you know, they dropped it. You know, I talked to the DA and he was like, you know, I, there's nothing I can do now. And I was like, I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry. That's your, that's who you're dealing with. That's all I can give you, you know? So a couple more hours went by and I'm going to say this was around like nine, maybe 10 at night. And all my family was kind of doing all the research. You know, I was still at home, you know, drinking. I didn't, I don't really have a heart when I drink. I kind of just let it go. And um, I got a phone call from my uncle. Keep in mind, I don't just sit here and say it's my mom that's, you know, dysfunctional and narcissistic, you know, manipulative. You know, I have, I come from a whole family that has different kinds of problems, you know. So I get a phone call from my uncle. I put it on speakerphone, you know, and I was like, um, I just heard like sobbing. You know, and I was like, what's the matter? And he was like, I, I got to call you back. And I was like, you got to call me back. And I was like, you, you got to tell me what's going on right now. Cause now you got, now I'm, now I'm turning, like what's going on, you know? And I, I go outside and he goes, um, they, they found her, they found her body. And I like, I, I think I, um, I think I went into like, um, I needed to hear it again. I was like, who, who found her? Who did you talk to? Who, you got to tell me who you talked to before you just, you know, drop that on me. Cause remember, I got to call my little brother. I got to call my sister. I'm sorry. I... And he goes, they found her, um, they found her body, you know, by the train tracks, it's her. And I immediately, um, I've always dreaded that day, you know, cause when you're dealing with someone that very selfish, very narcissistic and that mentally sick, you know, they don't, they don't think about you, you know, it's all about them, you know, and she's, you're not going to give me money, then I'm going to go kill myself. You're not going to do this. I'm going to go kill myself, you know, and her men don't want to talk to her. She's not thinking about us. She's just saying how she's going to kill herself. So I immediately broke down. I, I can't even describe to you the feeling, you know, I dropped to my knees and, um, um, my boyfriend just, you know, he held me, you know, I didn't want even want to be held. I just, I screamed. I cried to a point where I, I think I lost all like control of my body. I couldn't even move. And I sat there thinking to myself for like the first hour, like, did she, did she die like ugly? Did you, did you suffer? Did he, did you die alone? You know, did you sit there and lay there? And you know, like I, I broke down and I had to make that phone call to my sister and to get on the phone and hear my sister screaming the way that she did. And I wasn't strong enough to make the phone call to my little brother. I know I had, I had to let my sister be the big sister and she placed the phone call to my brother. I didn't want to hear it. And we spent the, the um, we ended up coming together at my house and gosh, we sat there and we cried for the longest time. I was, you know, screaming and, and then come the morning time after I had drank myself into this, you know, three, four wine bottles later, we get a phone call in the morning. And um, my little brother said that, um, that she was alive. And 
I didn't know whether or not to believe like, okay, like, dude, see, it's up and down all over again. I was like, okay, well, I don't, I don't think that's true because I was just told that a medical examiner, you know, found her or has her body or whatever the case may be, you know? So uh, a couple of days went by, I was with my, um, with my sister and I had, I drank myself to a point where I, I was like, you know what, I gotta, I gotta go home. I don't feel right. My body doesn't feel right. I feel like something, something's wrong. Something's going on. So I go home and, um, I ended up having to go to the hospital. I, excuse my language, but I really, I fucked up my kidneys really, really bad, you know? And, um, I went home and then I got a phone call from the same uncle and he told me, um, oh, she, it wasn't her. It was somebody else with the same, you know, Reaper tattoo, except for this lady had green eyes. And my head, I couldn't, I couldn't like, I couldn't process it. I couldn't process that I already have to deal with this person. But you should know to just, you know, you got to be sure about these things. Be sure, make sure that you're in, thinking in my head, like professionally, a medical examiner is going to, I don't even, I can't think of a medical examiner calling someone, you know, and just like, oh, okay, like I was expecting like police at the door or something, but it was like, I think it hurt me to a point where it's like, I'm, I'm surrounded by this. This is my family. This is what I'm going to deal with. This is my, you know, this is my kid's family, you know, and I was very disappointed with my uncle and very disappointed with my mom, you know, and, um, I just couldn't, I couldn't like, I couldn't process it, you know, till this day, you know, I haven't said anything. I have not told that story and opened up that she's even alive. I'm actually opening up here, you know, so when they see it, it's like, it's, and the thing that hurt me the most is when I finally messaged her phone. I was like, are you, what's going on? Like, are you, are you listening? Are you, can you answer me? Can you text me something? And she ends up messaging my uncle this long, this long story. Like, you know, I don't need to prove myself to anyone. I was here. I was not doing anything wrong. And how sad that the homeless checked up on me instead of my own family and this. And like, I could not believe it. I could not believe it. I was just like, do you know what I just went through? What your son just went through? What your grandkids just went through? What my sister just went through? You know, like I, I, could not believe it. I could not process it. I couldn't, I couldn't believe that I allowed her to get inside my head like that all over again, you know, and that's what, that's what I think the worst part of dealing with someone that's like that is because a suicidal person isn't going to speak on it. I believe personally, this is just my opinion because, um, believe me, I'll tell you, you know, someone that did in my family and didn't speak on it or anything. You know, but to deal with someone like her and I love her and I want the best for her and I want to help her, but yet you can, you could care less what, like to tell me like, you know, the homeless care more than I did. I was just so heartbroken with her. I was heartbroken. I was sick, bad. I had really did a number on myself that day, you know, and then days later having to go to the hospital, the hospital told me like, if you would have drank and kept going, you know, you probably wouldn't even be here. You know, and the only reason why I didn't keep drinking was because my sister, my sister was like, I'm gonna, we're gonna go back up to my house. I'm gonna take you with me. I was like, no, just leave me here. Just leave me here, take, take my daughter, you know, just leave me here. But there's no fighting with my sister. So I just, you know, I got in the car, but a couple of days later, I, I, started, I started my sobriety. Cause I thought to myself, like if I'm going to completely cut off, you know, this toxic person, I'm not going to cut out toxic to be toxic, to raise my kids the way that she was raising us, you know? So it was real. This is the, in my opinion, this is my, my personal testimony, you know, and this is the only time I can say that that woman has honestly helped me. Your dysfunctional ways have, honestly, they, I know it sounds crazy, but it's like it, it saved me because now I am 39 days sober today. And that's the longest I have been since 2019 when I got sober for a year. Good for you. Thank you. So this is just... Has this kind of thing happened with your mom before? Oh, yeah. 
just not not to this extent, you know. But I've we've gotten phone calls that, you know, she she writes it on her own Facebook, you know, R.I.P. And then she'll put her picture right there. You know anything about her background, how she was raised? Um, I've heard stories. I've heard stories. Um, I I've never. Um, I can't believe a lot of what my mom says. She is a she's a real man, I don't know whether to, you know, reward her for being that good or do I just keep my distance, you know, but she's just really, really good at, she can, man, she can tell you a story, you know, and I felt like she, um, I don't think she was raised the best, you know, I do, I'm aware of my, my grandmother, my grandmother was a very, very hard worker, but a very depressed woman, very depressed woman. So hearing the stories from my aunt, my uncle, you know, I can't, I can't really speak on it because I don't know, you know, my grandmother wasn't necessarily, you know, the nicest woman to me, but um, she was very loving with my sister, you know, um, I'll let my sister more or less, you know, I don't, I, like I said, I don't like to speak on things that I don't know 100% about, just what I've seen. You know, my grandfather was a um, correctional officer, he was, you know, amazing, but he had his he was stressed out, you know, he was stressed out. My grandma drank, you know, drinking runs in my family. I feel like we got alcohol running through our body more than anything. But yeah, she was a very depressed woman. She would drink all the time. So when my grandfather would come home late nights, everyone's drinking. My uncles were constantly fighting, like awful. Like we've seen fights where they would, if they weren't beating the life out of each other, they were one time my uncle, stabbed my other uncle, you know, and it was, and we were there, we were seeing all this. So if it wasn't chaos in one house, it was chaos in the other. It was just, no matter where we went, it followed everywhere. But at the same time, I would rather be at my grandparents' house than, you know, be with my mom. You know, she's, she's good. She's really good. She's the only time I've ever talked and um, told my school what had happened. Her, the man that was molesting me put a put a big bruise on my leg and she sent me to school in shorts and they asked me and you know how they give you that you know this is nobody's gonna hear anything it's just me and you they give you that that rundown make you trust them you know and I I I told her you know I was like you know he's he did it and she just make me walk home this was when we were in Fontana um I went home by the time I got there uh there was a social worker there already and whatever that story my mom was able to say, she was able to get that social work out of there. And my mom beat the shit out of me that day. I couldn't even go to school the next day. That's how bad it was. And she just, yeah, my mom was, she didn't, she didn't take care of us like she should have, you know. I met your, your family. Your, mm -hmm. is it your husband? Uh, no, boyfriend. Boyfriend and two kids. Yeah, two kids. Beautiful. Yes, thank you. Beautiful Yeah, they have family. two different, two different dads. So they're, they're. Those are my saviors. Those are. You seem to be doing a great job with your life now. Now. I'm going to say now. I'm, I would never, you know, put out to the world, like on my social media, I've, I've barely started to open up and tell, you know, tell what's going on. From, from, from the time I was actually able to, like, make my own decisions, I have always said, and you can ask anybody that knows me, I have always, always wanted to write a book. I am a writer. I love to write my journals. That's what I dove into is my journals and music. Um, I always told my family, like, I'm going to get older and I'm going to write a book. You know, like, it's always been my thing because that's my only safety and trust that I had was in that book. You know, my mom broke it so many times. She would, she would make fun of me. She would, you know, she would read them, and then I'd get beat for what I'm writing, you know. So it was very – it was – it's, it was a process, you know, but now um, I've been through my own, you know, my own shit with my kids. I feel like my, my daughter is, my daughter's been with me. That is my, my day one, you know, and I felt like her loyalty is just as strong as my loyalty when I was little, you know. So um, I had them taken away by CPS. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, 20, 20, 22. Because of your drinking? Uh, yeah, it played a big role. Yeah, it played a big role. Um, we uh, we would get my boyfriend's kids um, only every other weekend, and um, at that time, you know, I don't I don't like being lied to. You know, I rather just fear. Hey, if you're falling down the hill, then just tell me. 
you know, especially with dope. Um, I don't, I mean, I'm glad and thankful that I didn't fall into dope. You know, I have a very addictive personality. You know, I smoke a vape and I'm like, that's gonna be it. Drinking is my poison, you know, but dope is just, I think I've grown a hate to it because my mom, you know, and then my sister at one point, you know, but my sister recovered, you know, wonderfully. She's a great mother, you know, and me, I, I didn't think I would ever end up with someone that, you know, got addicted to that, you know, and, and um, I knew he was doing it. And I think it pissed me off because he kept lying about it. When you know someone, you know someone, you know, and I knew he was doing it. I just, I was getting pissed off because I didn't want to be lied to, you know, and we had had, you know, our relationship has been rocky since the very beginning, you know, but when I feel like when broken meets broken, you guys feel like you guys can fix each other, you know, put all those pieces back together as one, you know, like you always feel like you got to save someone else. And we, um, started off rocky we you know i can honestly say at least today i can be like we're we're all right we're all right right now you know but at that time we weren't all right i knew he was doing it and i had like the fuck it's i was like i'm gonna i'm gonna drink then i'm gonna drink and i'm gonna pick on you like that's how that was my you know that was my wrong thinking that was my bad you know and um we had fought physically you know multiple times before but particularly that night, uh, I drank on it. I stewed on it when I could have just left it alone. He had his kids, unfortunately, that weekend, and I had my daughter that weekend. And um, my son was uh, two and a half months at that time, and I was just, you know, I was angry. And when I drink, I like, like any other person, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get angry, and that's exactly what I did, you know. So when I came inside, I started like just. I know you're lying and this and that, you know, I was saying out loud, like, I know you're on dope and this and that, you know, I was just, I was going for the jugular. We ended up, um, we ended up fighting and, um, the kids were there, you know, they, they seen and stuff. And, um, he doesn't have the, the best other mother of the kids, you know, particularly, I would say she's a very, very vindictive person, has been from the beginning. She don't get what she wants and she knows where to hit them, where it hurts, you know, and he's a good dad and he loves his kids. You know, he's been fighting for his kids till this day. He's fighting for his kids. And, um, she's just not, I don't think she's, I don't think she's a good person. That's how I'm going to lay it out there. You know, I try not to have so much, you know, hostility towards people, but I just say it how it is, you know, and the phone call was not placed out of concern. It was, uh, I want to say it was an opportunity because she wants him completely out of, you know, their lives. And I think she took that opportunity and I don't sit here and say like, you know, it's her fault. It's this, I learned in therapy, like my therapist gave me a good, you know, she didn't have your kids taken away. You had your kids taken away. And that's exactly how I look at it because I did, you know, and, um, the phone call was placed uh, a couple days after the fight, you know, 24 hours, CPS is going to be at the door. Well, unfortunately when they did come to the house, it was like 11 o'clock at night. I was heavily intoxicated. Neither one of my kids were there. My daughter was actually across the way at a, um, at a friend's house and I was with one of my friends and we were just drinking, you know, and they came there and I became very, very, you know, defensive. I was telling them that I was absolutely not drinking when you could smell it on my breath, you know, they had officers with them, you know, I was very, I was very, you know, defensive. So, um, of course they use that against me, which I can't, I don't sit here and, you know, deny it. But, um, so after that, they started doing the, okay, we're going to give you the resources. I didn't want the resources. I was just like, nope, I don't want anything to do with you. Like, and I already have it out for CPS because I've, you know, I should have been taken from my mom. I don't know how you didn't see that. I don't know how, you know, all the medical stuff that I've been through. I don't know how I wasn't taken. None of us were taken, you know? So personally, I feel like the, the system, you know, you, you did, you failed me, you failed me, you failed my brother, my sister, you know, but that's another story. So, um, So she, um, she started making home visits, you know, um, at that point, I'm going to say like maybe 10 days went by. I completely cut off all communication with CPS. I didn't, um, which is the worst thing I could have done. I cut off all communication. I didn't answer the door. I didn't answer uh, the police, nothing. So I got to the point where February 3rd, 
they came and uh, my daughter got off the bus. She came in and not 20 minutes later, they were knocking at the door again. And I thought it was just, you know, same thing. I'm, they're just not going to answer the door. They're going to leave. Well, then like another 30 minutes went by and they came and they came with the sheriffs and they said they have a warrant and they're going to bust down the door. You know, in my head, I'm thinking like just we should just open the door. But, you know, I we didn't. And they they broke down the door and they walked directly up. And Mark has a um, Your boyfriend. Yeah. He has a. Um, he has a criminal history. So he immediately got um, he got taken out pretty pretty bad, you know. So I was the only one there with my. Um, sorry, this is very. This is where I get like. Um, she walked up to me and she told me that um, we're here to place your children in protective custody. And in my head, I got very defensive. I got like, you're not taking my kids anywhere, you know. And I started getting to the point where it was like, you know, my daughter was like holding on to me and, you know, my son, I had my son, you know, I was nursing at that time and I was real, I was getting defensive and I was starting to get to the point where, you know what, if you're going to, if you think you're going to take my kids, you might as well just shoot me, you know, like I'm, I'm not going to give you my kids. But seeing how my daughter was reacting, my daughter was, she was like starting to hyperventilate. She was starting to, you know, my daughter's very, very intelligent, unusually intelligent. And I knew she knew it. And so I just had like a tunnel vision moment where I thought to myself, like, it doesn't matter how hard I fight right now. It doesn't matter what I say, what I do, they're gonna take them anyway, you know? And the best thing I can do right now as a mother is just calm her down, you know? So I asked for five minutes, I, I, got, her, um, I got her in the room and I was able to tell her like, I'll, I'll get you out. If I don't come for you, believe me, somebody, you know, will, will come for you. You know, at that time her dad was incarcerated so I couldn't, you know, really go to him, but, um, I ended up reaching out to his family and they ended up taking both of my kids. So um, they were out of placement. They stayed in placement for 24 hours and then another 24 hours in temporary foster until they went with relatives. They were there for a month until I was able to get them back, um, you know, having to do my classes and stay sober. And me, myself, I'm a very, you know, intelligent person. You know, right now I'm in school for criminal justice and the only thing that motivated me with that was because, you know, CPS and how my kids were being treated. I felt like they were being treated more like a number than they were, you know, actually what's what's best for them. You know, they were telling me that they're gonna come make home visits and they they never came, you know, like I would see them like at, you know, the end of the month and stuff. So I have my, my fair share, you know, a lot of my drinking took a lot of the first couple of years away with my daughter, you know, I was dancing um, I was drinking, you know, and I was living with my family at that time. Well, they were living with me, and then um, I just kind of leave the responsibility to my sister. Like, oh, she needs to eat dinner, this, that, you know. Like, my sister was like the wife at home in a way. Why well, I just, you know, went to the clubs. And I think um, the dancing was a way for me to forget about everything. Some days I would just sit and just drink. I wouldn't even work. It was just a place for me to just sit there and be left alone so I could just sit there and drink. I'd start fights. I would, you know, wasn't, never been the best drinker. Never will be the best drinker, you know. The effects of dealing with your mom is inspiration for getting straight now? Yeah. Yeah, because she's, you know, there's a time where you got to just, you got to turn your back, you know. And I, I don't know how I would react if I got the real news, like the final news, you know, because now I feel like you've, She's put me in a position where it's like I'm, I think that's where God comes in because this is honestly the closest I've been with. I'm not like a, you know, holy roller or anything. I just, this is the first time in my life that I've welcomed prayer and reached out because I got to a point where I was like, I can't, I can't live like this. You know, like I, all I've ever wanted from that woman was just her love, her attention, you know, some trust here and there, you know, and I, hearing the stories even when I was younger because I, I was actually not even supposed to be here. I was uh, supposed to die from the tumor that I got when I was six. So um, I don't remember uh, very much. I remember the hospital I was in, Loma Linda. I remember um, just always being in pain. My sister always told me, you know, like you, you've always, you were always in pain, you know, you'd want to come and play or you'd want to eat something. You were just always in pain, you know, and uh, one time my Grandparents came to visit. Um, I had like 
the biggest stomach. You know, everybody told me like you looked pregnant, you know, and by the time they got me there, the hospital said it was it was too late, you know, like you this is a tumor. How did you let it, you know? And how do you? I think about it now too. Like how do you how do you not see that? How do you not see a tiny I was a very tiny girl, you know? How did you not see your own daughter, you know, in pain? How did you not pay attention, you know? And that was not my first trip to the hospital. Um my mom one time um she she dropped like her her like a like a little ball of meth inside of her beer one time. And from the beginning that I can remember, my mom's always given us beer, you know, that pink tequila that they the tequila rose. We would have little sips of that here and there, you know, to put us to sleep. She was man, I've been taking NyQuil for since since I was young. She used to call it our cocktails, you know, so um she, she was drinking, you know, in her she used to say, you know, once my nose gave out, I had to do something else. So she would put it in her beer. She put it in her beer one time, and I drank that. I took a I took a big drink out of her beer, and, you know, my uncle told me, like, he's like, when I was holding you, and he was like, I can, like, see your heart, you know. And there again, you know, where was CPS? How do you go to a hospital? How do you explain, you know, a child, you know, that's coming in here positive for meth, and you're just, I don't understand it. You know, I've never understood it, you know, and that and you not seeing the fact that I was being, you know, molested at any opportunity in front of her in plain sight, you know, not not like in front of her, but in plain sight, you know, he would get me when I was, she'd be cooking and I'd have to just sit there with this, you know, sick, not stomach. And it was like, I didn't, I didn't understand why, you know, at that time I'd, that's why my grandparents usually were my safe zone. And as crazy as that sounds, cause over there it's, wasn't no better. It was dysfunctional over there too, you know, but at least I know I'm not, you know, being touched over there, you know, and I felt like I made the grave mistake one time of, I told my uncle, you know, um, I was really close with my uncle and I told my uncle, I felt like that to me, that was the worst mistake I could have made because my uncle like blew up. He waited for him to come home. You know, they ended up fighting physically. And my mom, again, she was like, look what you did. Look what you did. You know, you open your big mouth. And it's like, I started realizing maybe like eight or nine, she knew. She knew, and that, that wasn't just the, you know, the first person, you know. Um, she would take me to these people's houses in Fontana. She would, I don't know, they were like this weird swinger couple, and they had kids, and I got molested by one of their kids, you know, and I never said anything. I was just like, it started to become normal. It started to just become like, you know what, it's, this is my life. This is, you know, like, that's why family pictures are very hard you know, because looking at them, there's always something behind them. There's always a story behind them or that happened on that day, you know. So it's very, we, me and my sister, don't we don't like looking at the pictures, you know. So I feel like surviving this is, is I think I'm a hell of a lot more sane than I should be, you know, because I, I think I've put myself through so much and blamed her for so much you know, that I just, I self-destructed. That's how I was always felt. You know, my uncles used to tell us, oh, you guys are gonna be pregnant when you're like 16. And it's like, yeah, well, whatever. You know, my mom was a dancer. That's what made me, you know, say, fuck it, I'll dance too. Cause, you know, and I didn't tell her, I didn't want to tell her, I was ashamed to tell her, you know, but I ended up having to spit it out. And honestly, I, I was like, what are you mad for? You did it. You know, at one point she was like my, I wanted to be like her. I was like, man, my mom's really tough. She goes out there, she fights all these women. She takes on these men, you know, like not realizing how, how dysfunctional, that's the only word I can use for it, how bad this is, you know? And I always, it was normal to me, you know, until this day, you know, I still have contact with the man that, you know, molested me. I still, you know, I, I went down almost the same exact path you know, I dove into drink. I've been drinking with my mom for a long time. Friday was the day. Every Friday, it's like, all right, we're gonna we're gonna drink. You know, like she would give me, she would give me alcohol before I would take my tests when I was going to school. You know, she'd give me water bottles of Cisco, and I was like, all right, well, you know. And they're over there telling me like, what does that smell? You know, like, and I just, you know, I managed to keep going to school. That's one thing that um, my little brother managed to graduate without no motivation. You know, and. She was a very difficult person, you know, and the only person I feel like I 
I looked up to as a male, you know, male idol was my, was my grandfather. My grandfather was, you know, he was, to me, was everything in that family, you know, he was like the glue. You know, he's a very grouchy man, but when you get older, you start realizing, like, he was grouchy because so he had to pay all these bills, you know, he had to file for bankruptcy, you know, and she's always been, like, an, an entitled person, you know, and she treated my grandfather like that because I guess that's how she grew up, you know, he always spoiled her. That's where I feel like she got this, you know, she's so entitled, like, you guys have to take care of me, what am I supposed to do? I don't have any money, I'm on the streets, and it's like, I don't get a job, or maybe, you know, but she always crutches on that, I'm mental, I can't. You know, like, I'm not allowed to work. I'm not, like, you know, and my grandfather was my, he was, he was a great man, you know, really good man. He provided for his family, and at the end, um, my grandfather started getting, um, not Alzheimer's, uh, what is that other one? Dementia, yeah, he started getting dementia. You know, my grandfather always told us, you know, if I start getting like that, just take me out to the backyard and shoot me. I was be like, gosh, don't don't talk like that, you know. But he, um, that's exactly what what he did. Um, 2016. He just, I think he had enough. My mom drained him like a lot financially, emotionally. You know, she started little by little taking things away from him. I mean, he wasn't able to drive, but you know, um, you know, she would be taking money from the safe and. You know, slowly but surely, that can really break someone down. You know, when you have everything, you go from providing, having your house nice and this, to just being completely everything just taken out, you know, right beneath you. And 2016, um, we were all outside, and we tried to keep the smoking away from him. You know, it was it's like a fucking game. <laughs> we hear him coming or the back door slam, you know, everybody better run. You know, and it wasn't that we were going to get in trouble. It was because it was... Don't, don't do that in front of, you know, don't, I call him dad, we call him dad. And um, he came outside and my little brother goes, oh, look, there's, there's dad. He's like, he just waved at me. And I was like, oh, okay, you know. Um, my brother noticed he was dressed and I noticed that his whole room was clean. He put his little dog in the back and um, he got really dressed, you know, his little turquoise necklace, like he's, you know, and not even like three, four minutes later, uh, I remember I was smoking a great presidential. And I went past it and you just heard a loud bang. And we all kind of stopped because it sounded similar to a firework, but you know the difference. If you know, you know the difference between you know a gunshot and a firework. My little brother goes, dad's outside, he went to the back. And so we all got up, you know, my mom booked it first, you know, and gosh, I, she let out this, she got like right, because the garage was in the back, she just got like right there to where she can see all the way in the back. She just let out this horrible scream. You know, she's like, no, and just screamed, you know, and I was, I went to grab her and um, she she told me he, he shot himself and I went to look over. And at that time I had a friend that went back there, he was there and he, he yelled to me and he was like, um, your dad's still alive. So I went running back there, you know, I, um, I went and I looked at him and he had, um, he used a python and he shot himself. Like, I don't, I think he maybe meant to do it a different way, but he just kind of got himself in the throat. So in the front, I looked at it and I was just like, you know, automatically how I, you know, how he always taught me, I, I kind of went medical. I was like, okay, well, this looks not that bad. And, but I can, you know, hear the gurgle and stuff and. I uh, I went to pull him forward because I wanted to see, I didn't want to touch him, you know, or, or you know, but I had um, pulled him forward and I seen the back of his neck and the back of the neck was just, you know, completely blown out. So I pushed him back forward and I just, I called and I was like, just, you know, and I sat there with him and I think um, Everything I told him, because I just couldn't help but just tell him, like, this is probably the last. I'm not, he's not going to make it. You know, he's an older man. I just told him, um, you know, I love you. You know, and I'm, I don't know why you did this, but I, I love you. And in my head, I, I think he felt like he didn't serve a purpose anymore. You know, because he was the kind of man that people would come over and he would just want to talk to you. 
and everybody kind of would just like, oh, okay, yeah, you know, walk away. Even me, you know, sometimes. And I felt like maybe he felt like he didn't serve any kind of purpose to us anymore. So I just told him, you know, I love you. I've always loved you. Thank you for everything that you've done. And I'm sorry. I'm sorry this, you know, this happened to you. I'm sorry. I promised myself I wasn't going to cry. You know, and um, after that, I, uh, after, thank you. After um, they got him into a, um, a helicopter, you know, and he ended up making it to the hospital. He lived for a couple of days, but he had signed... Um, this thing that he didn't want to be uh, artificially prolonged. He didn't want to, you know, so we were going head to head with the with the hospital and stuff. And they told us, you know, it, he's not going to, he's not going to have a good life, you know. So my mom ended up letting him go, you know, and not even a couple of weeks later, you know, everything started getting sold off. You know, like it's, it's, I think, a mother has the power to to give a child the best love, to always remember that. And when they go, you're not going to be sad. You'll be sad, but you're just going to have those such good memories of that woman that it's going to motivate you to keep going and to keep, you know, make her proud even if she's not here. And a mother has the power, an evil power, to make her children feel just worthless. And I feel like that's, that's what my mom did. You know, she betrayed my trust and she made me feel like I, like I was nothing to her when she was my everything, you know, and I can never sit here and blame her for what I do as an adult, you know, but when I had my daughter, I just wasn't, you know, I wasn't ready to settle down, you know, and and I wasted so much time, you know, and now I felt like I always feel like I, you know, I did worse than my mom. I got my kids taken away, you know, but everything happens, you know, for, for a reason. I feel like this is exactly what was supposed to happen to me, you know, and I can't help but to sit here and think like, you know what, she, she helped me to just turn this around, you know, will I ever speak to her again? Probably not. Probably not. I have to find forgiveness with her, but, you know, going through all of this and watching her, you know, almost kill herself for men, like, and many times, many times, you know, my mom would be, she threw herself out of a car one time, a moving car. We were on the freeway, you know, and I had to watch her. I had to watch her roll and then hit the wall. And then I look back and I'm like, gosh, woman, like, when is this going to stop? You know, why are you so why are you so weak? You what know? is your biggest fear right now? My biggest fear is falling back in alcohol mm. and becoming becoming what she is, not finding that strength, not finding the strength to leave a toxic relationship, not finding the strength to know the difference between, you know, my reality or is it, am I doing this for me? You know, do I stay in this? You know, I'll never forgive myself for for the CPS thing because as their mother, as their nurturer, I should have been the one to, to walk away. I should have walked away for the sake of my kids and for the sake of you know, my own, you know, my own personal reasons. I should have left when I seen the red flags. I should have left when the toxic was, you know, right in front of me, but I wasn't strong enough. And because of that, my kids had to pay the price for it, you know, and that's hard. You know, like domestic violence, when you hear domestic violence, you kind of, some people think like, oh, it's one person or it's, you know, I'm getting beat, you know, because at that time they didn't, they didn't even give me a chance to explain. And it's like, I don't consider myself like a battered woman. We, when we fight, like, you know, and there goes my mother's kind of mentality, like, Psh, I'm not going to call the cops on you. You know, I'm going to lock that door. We're going to see who comes out the bigger man, you know, but it's like, what, what kind of, how is that normal? You know, how do you survive that? How do you, you know, get through that? And I have two different kinds of people watching me. I have my son watching me and my daughter. Is she going to, well, my mom went through it. I can go through it. You know, like I wasn't proud. That wasn't going through my head. I'm sitting here thinking like, oh, psh, I know you're doing drugs and I'm going to find out one way or another, you know, when no, you could just leave the whole situation. That is what 
a mother is supposed to do. You're, you, that's that's where, you know, that's my biggest fear is not being able to find that strength to be like, you know what? I gotta I gotta just you know, walk away from this, you know. So I think our sobriety has been you know it's been good. Mine um, mine was more recent, you know, because I I'm terrible when I drink. And everybody knows it. People in the strip club will tell you, you know, like because I've hold, I've held in so much of this baggage, you know, when you drink, you start to become, you know, the old man at the bar telling his Vietnam stories. Nobody wants to hear that shit. Nobody wants to hear it. I'm like, all right, you know, like, you know, and that's how it would that's how it would come. We'd be having I'd go from having, you know, a couple of shots. We're feeling good and making some money to just like this is what I went through you know like you guys don't understand like just pouring it all out this is why I feel like since as long as I have known you know this is my my book is like you know my family tells me like what are you waiting for it's like man I got I got so much in here I don't know how to feel like when I start writing like I'm tearing through the paper because it's like you just want to let it all out I feel like closure is something that I've never had in my life not with relationships not with my mom like how can a person go through so much and that's it you just gotta you just gotta deal with it you know it makes me sad you know nobody should have to go through that and some people are embarrassed to let out their stories I was I was I was I didn't want to tell anybody what I went through I didn't want to be that person that you know I wanted to I wanted to in my head I wanted to just let it go you know and just move forward but it doesn't work that way not for me Jessica, what would you say is the most important lesson you've learned in all of this? The most important lesson is not letting your past, your history, and who you were define you, honestly, because that's what I think I did. I let everything just, and I'm not, I'm not a bad person. We can all reinvent ourselves at any oh, time. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. Definitely. That's why I, it's, that's not just for, you know, me. I see all I see all kinds of, you know, your stories. You know, I, I see it. And if anything, you know, it's it's everybody's going through something. You might not believe it. You can, you can have the nicest clothes. You can have psh, nicest shoes. You can have the nicest car, but nobody knows what's going on. You don't know what's nobody's going on inside your head. You know, and that's where I feel like I, I've led it for so long. I'm 31 years old, and I catch myself like, it's too late for me. You know, therapy, I can go to therapy. I particularly had to do it when I was in CPS. I loved therapy. But I have so much built up that I'd get pissed off because an hour wasn't enough. I'm like, well, there goes $150. I didn't even get it all out. You know, like, you start to think, like, what am I supposed to do now? Now, some people don't get that privilege. Like, it's either $150 on my therapy and I work on myself, or am I going to spend $150 on these groceries and these kids? You know, I don't get, I don't get, some people don't get both of those, you know, luxuries at the same time. And me, I still have to keep telling myself, like, I'm still okay. I'm 31, but I still have a, I still got some time, you know, because sometimes it's just like, no, I don't need therapy. I'm already, my life's already technically over. I've lived a long life. But what I tell myself today that keeps me going and why I'm going to, you'll hear, you'll hear more of me. You'll see me more because I'm going to stick by this is I lived a very shitty life. I lived a very shitty, dysfunctional life. You know, that's not even half of what, you know, everything I've been through. But I won't die like this. I'm not going to be that story, that sad story that my kids are going to go tell their kids. That's not how I'm going to go out. So. Excellent. Jessica, I wish you the best. Thank you. Thank you very much.